The Precinct Omega Weekly Podcast is supported by Horizon Wars Zero Dark, sci-fi skirmish war games in a fallen earth. Visit Wargame Vault at wargamevault.com and search for Zero Dark. Welcome to another episode of the Precinct Omega Miniatures podcast. My name is Roby Jenkins and I am really thrilled to be joined today by New York Times bestselling author, a prolific storyteller with a catalogue of fiction, non-fiction, novels, short stories, audio books, you name it. But we are not here to talk about novels. We are here to talk about games with man himself, Gav Thorpe. Welcome to the podcast, Gav. Hello, nice to be here. Nice it's, to uh, see you again. It's, 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 it's reassuring to see that it looks like we're getting a steady recording because uh, the listeners won't know, but we have already been trying to do this for 10 <laughs> minutes and, and had a catastrophic failure. So we've given up on the video. We've gone back to audio only. So apologies to my regular YouTube listeners, but you're stuck with this. Um, Gav, you and I have, have met before uh, in, in the flesh, before all of this. Uh, Not previous. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but... But ages and ages ago, first of all, we crossed paths over a decade ago when I was trying to persuade Games Workshop that there ought to be a second edition of Inquisitor. You were nice enough to meet me at Warhammer World and, and give me your thoughts on, on what I had proposed. Um, obviously, that never happened, but we'll talk about that later. Um, and then we met a few years ago at Salute when you were demoing Open Combat. Yes, that's right. Yes, that's a friend's game. And yes, I remember um, both of those occasions very well. Um, and uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was um, uh, it's interesting because I say I feel like I know you. Um, <laughs> but, but it doesn't, doesn't hurt that you're a patron of the yeah. Patreon. So, you know, you do you do get to see my stuff probably more often than I get to see your stuff, which is saying something because you are truly prolific on the on the writing side. Yeah, I think so. And also, uh, you know, again, back in the day, you were very active in the Inquisitor community yeah. uh, and things like that. So again, even though we didn't necessarily meet, we interacted quite a lot, I feel, and, and have done. So yeah, it's one of the reasons why I wanted to support the patrons. Like, oh yeah, he, I think he kind of knows what he's doing. I'd be interested to see what he's up to these days. Well, and then, think, yes. Yeah, I've been I think... clinging to your, to your apron strings since, since the start, <laughs> really. <laughs> yeah, well, I, yeah, they're probably a bit stretched by now, I think. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, it was uh, it was cool, and uh, and to at salute, I remember because it was just after Horizon Worlds had come out, right. I believe, um, and you had your shiny new book, and I was I explaining uh, my friend Carl's game as well, and run you through that. That was nice to catch up. Yeah, so yeah, it's it's. Um, We've got a bit of previous, and it'd be nice to, to catch up again. At some the, point, at some day. point after all this, I'll make this up to... Because you are still Nottingham-based, aren't you? Yes, that's right, yes. I'll still in the in lead belt. So, well, yeah. I, I find it almost inconceivable that any of my listeners could not have heard of Gav Thorpe in, in some form or another. And I, I know you've told this story many times, not least to me, like 10 minutes ago, um, <laughs> before, before our first attempt crashed. But, but for those who maybe only know you from one aspect of what you do, could you possibly share with my listeners a, a brief potted biography of who Gav Thorpe is, how, how you got into games, game design, Games Workshop, how, what you did at Games Workshop, how you got out of Games Workshop and what you've been doing since? Right then, so, um, yes, so I'm, I'm of the sort of uh, the generation of gamers that started with sort of D and D. Um, so I was introduced to gaming by my cousin, and he had like second edition Warhammer. Mm -hmm. And I remember, and I bought third edition Warhammer and Warhammer Siege and all that sort of stuff. But I didn't really play it very much, very much in Realm of Chaos books. Certainly, you know, of, of that generation of doing a lot of arm, armchair gaming around Warhammer. Absolutely. Um, so what I'm mainly, and also Rogue Trader came out in 1987. I remember playing that with a friend. Uh, and, and collecting that. But the game we played the most in terms of Games Workshop was the Epic mm. game. Mm. Uh, Adeptus Titanicus, Space Marine, uh, and, and Second Edition Space Marine, and had a huge orc army for that, which I wish I'd kept these days. Yes. Um, yeah, and, and, but it, this, occasionally. Absolutely. I had like about 8,000 points of orcs. Um, uh, and so, uh, basically, when I, when I was going through sort of secondary school, my my ideal was that I wanted to be an illustrator, and that was what I kind of had an eye on doing. Uh, but it turned out I wasn't very 
it wasn't really good enough to be an illustrator, um, or, or at least it, uh, when I went to apply for the college foundation course, they they wanted to do a bridging course. Yeah. My A-level. So basically, it was all going to take a lot longer than I wanted to, and I wasn't that you know I'm not that academically minded and and all the rest of it. So essentially, I didn't end up doing that. But what I had also been doing is writing stuff, mm. uh, making up games and scenarios, troop types, campaigns, drawing maps, you know, all that kind of stuff they do when you're a gamer and you're 14, 15. Oh, 16. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I was um, with you on that. Yes. And uh, uh, and so what happened is at Games Day 1993, uh, sort of, uh, I... I mean, I'd written some Blood Bowl rules because I played quite a bit of Blood Bowl as well because I had friends who we were into American football. We actually played American football for a local team. And uh, so actually getting them to play Blood Bowl was a, an easy segue ah. as well. Uh, so they weren't necessarily committed gamers, but they could play Blood Bowl. Um, and this was the, the Psycho Styrene pitch. And, yeah, yeah. Um, so, well. uh, so I'd actually written some rules uh, in my spare time for quadrupeds. So, so what mm. was known to all centaurs uh, with the Chaos Dwarves and um, uh, like centaurs and um, Zotes. Dragon so, Ogres Zotes. and Zotes, yes. Yes, yes. Zotes, Zotes in Blood Bowl, basically, is what I tell people. I wrote <laughs> rules for Zotes in Blood Bowl. That's how old school it was. Um, and uh, and, I ha- and I just took them to Games Day uh, to show Jervis Johnson, the designer of Blood Bowl, uh, for, for reasons, because I could, basically. And why not? Uh, and why not? And and he liked them. He said, "Oh, these are pretty good." Uh, he then lied to me and said, "Oh, I'm working on a new expansion for the game." <laughs> <laughs> when in fact, actually, he was writing the new edition of the game, the third edition Blood Bowl. I think is the one. Yeah, the, yeah. The, the big box set with the blocky the guys. And everything. No. Yes. yes. And um, he said, "But don't give them to me here because I'll lose them in the breakdown and everything like that." So send them to me at the design studio. He said the address is in White Dwarf. Um, I was like, "Okay, cool." And so what I decided to do was like, well, if I'm going to do that, I might as well send him some other stuff if he likes it. Uh, and so I borrowed my mum's electric typewriter because I didn't have like a PC or a printer or anything. Uh, and I wasn't at school anymore, so I couldn't even use like the computer lab at school. Um, typed up, I spent a week typing up stuff, like epic rules and blah, blah, rules. And this new, I invented a race called the Shishelian League, which is like lizard men in space, mm-hmm. uh, which eventually became the town. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, later on, weird things. Things that you invented when you were 17 that end up being an army, into, you know, 17 years later, whatever. Um, but anyway, and I put it all in an envelope and I put a cover letter in saying, hi, uh, I'm Gav, here's some stuff I've written. I'd really like to work in the design studio. Do you need anyone to empty the bins? I don't <laughs> mind doing that. Uh, which was on the back of, I'd already applied a couple of times at Games Workshop to work in retail and that mm. hadn't worked out because they wanted retail minded people. But so, uh, which was probably the biggest break I had was not actually working for Games Workshop <laughs> in retail rather. Um, and they were been looking, this was, a, so the early 90s, Games Workshop was really expanding and they had, uh, one of the things they wanted to expand was their games design department. Mm. Uh, and part of that was they wanted to get in some trainees. So they had this position called, there are three positions for assistant games developers uh, that there was advertising White Dwarf. I looked at it and it said, and that was back when you used to be able to say things like 21 or older. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, well, or basically it just said, you know, we're looking for someone, preferably like an English graduate, something like that. Basically somebody who can write. They weren't even that fussed about the game design side. Yeah. Although, obviously, you had to be like into the games already, so they just kind of assumed you'd be into gaming. And you, they, you, you guaranteed they, that they by just setting the it. salary low enough that only somebody who yeah. wanted to write games would do. <laughs> well, that, yes. Well, that was the interesting part. I mean, and they had, I was very lucky. Like I said, this, this story is basically just right place, right time. Mm. It's very, it's not very useful for other people. And it's the same with my writing career as well, to be honest. Um, uh, and they had three people, and then two of the people dropped out for various reasons. Um, uh, and then, so they were looking for two more people, and I kind of just happened to come along a little bit later after the press and go, hello, I've written some stuff, which they kind of liked. They got me up to Nottingham for an interview, so I got to meet Rick uh, and do an interview with Rick, and I, again, I remember borrowing uh, my mum's briefcase <laughs> that she had for... Uh, uh, and so to put stuff in, and I had photos, badly taken photos of my armies, and things like that and the lock was a bit dodgy and i had to borrow a metal ruler to get the lock open in the interview and stuff like that and um uh, and chat to rick for a little bit and then we had a tour of the design studio which was you know worth the admission price alone like yeah. sculptures and stuff and i remember also coming through games dev and jervis johnson and andy chambers were playing a game of 40k on the playtest table 
Now, that's one of those, oh, right, okay. Uh, and Andy, uh, so Rick said, oh, this is Gav, he's up for an interview for the Assistant Games Developer. And, and, I, was, and I was like, and they were playtesting the Falcon Grav Tank for the Eldar. And Andy turned to me and just, and they said, oh, we're playtesting the Falcon Grav Tank for the Eldar. What do you think of that? Okay, because Andy can be quite forthright. And um, so I was like, uh, well, that must be quite tricky to balance, really, because, you know, it's like the whole thing is like tanks are quite shooty and, you know, but, and quite uh, strong, but they're, they're slow and, you know, not very manoeuvrable. So if you make them a skimmer, that's obviously going to negate some of their, their natural weaknesses. So, you know, it'd be quite expensive and quite powerful. And he just went, hmm, yes. And that was it. Really. Um, but he was very, very, they were very impressed with that answer, apparently. Um, so that was good. <coughs> um, so that was it, really, and then and then I, so that was on the Friday. And the Monday, I got a phone call from the personnel department saying, "Yes, we'd like to offer you a job as an assistant games developer. When can you start?" So the following Monday, I was in Nottingham as an assistant games developer, um, and that, that was an interesting job because basically, like I say, it's a two-year contract. Uh, Rick had this idea that it would be this kind of slightly bohemian student lifestyle that he and Hal and others had kind of slightly had when they'd been starting out, with the exception. So we didn't, we weren't paid very much. We paid six thousand pounds a year, but we actually, we had, um, but we had rent free. We were basically accommodated in a company house. Oh wow! In Eastwood, opposite the factory. So like Saturday morning, we could just walk over to the mail order and just like pick metal for uh, at cost price and stuff, um, which was quite good. Uh, but it was a bit of a shock when suddenly you suddenly you go from that to actually having to pay rent and yeah. <laughs> we had a cleaner as part of that as well. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't well, know what the days were like, but they were certainly better than most people's if that was it. But anyway, yeah, that was great. And she used to cook us breakfast every morning, which was brilliant. Janet, she was great. Um, but anyway, so and then so uh, and we started the Citadel Journal. Yeah. Uh, which was basically just a way of cutting our teeth on games design and. Uh, uh, and writing, and but also layout and photography and all kinds of other stuff. To go this to. was in the days when it was that A5 yes, format. It was kind of, I mean, that was a magnificent... I, I just devoured yes. the Citadel Journal. That was so such a, a formative publication. Yes, I've got some here somewhere. But, um, I think I got yeah, them in mind, but was, they, they sat yeah. on them for years, yeah. <laughs> um, and, and that was really useful. And I think that grounding, uh, just like, say... Uh, in the kind of basic production values and, and systems and stuff has kind of seen me through to this day, which uh, uh, we'll get into this in a little bit. But anyway, so we did that. The, the very first job I had was pasting up uh, so basically the printouts of the war gear cards from the Dark Millennium supplement for 40k second edition. So 40k second edition had just come out at that games day, basically. Mm. Uh, and so... Uh, they're still working on Dark Millennium. Well, so Andy and that was the one that, that was, it was Plastic Orcs and Space Marines, but it came with the fabulous yeah. cardboard Dreadnought. That's right, yes. Yes, yes this is the one with the... Yeah, it, was, it couldn't do big models, so so Warhammer had, like, the, the Wyvern and the Chariot. Um, yes. Uh, uh, sorry, no, not the Wyvern. So this was... That was... Had uh, Grom the Paunch mm. on the Chariot and Eltharion on the Griffin. Yes. Um, yeah, so... And the, the cardboard Dreadnought uh, for the Orcs... Um, so yeah, and, and get a, basically a, a pack of normal playing cards and these printouts, and just said, cut those out, stick those on them. And that was my first job. Mm. Um, and then, and we did, we basically did play testing and stuff. Is uh, you know, and of course there was the Blood Bowl League was going on, so that was cool. Then the Necromunda was being designed, so we we're playing Necromunda as part of the studio campaign, and that was a big kind of play testing thing. Uh, after a year, I went to White Dwarf magazine and was a mm -hmm. staff writer and production assistant type on White Dwarf magazine, um, which again was another step up in terms of you know, everything we've been doing on the journal was analog. Yes. Um, although desktop publishing was starting to come in and I'd done a little bit of a like a, an evening class of desktop publishing before uh, I joined Games Workshop actually. I'd done it for about four, literally for four weeks or so. Um, um, but we did everything manual paste up, so cutting stuff out, printing stuff out, cutting it with a scalpel, sticking it down, yeah. and then sending it off to a reefer graphics house. And very old school. Anyway, uh, we uh, luckily we didn't have to quite do that on White Dwarf. They actually had big computers that could just about handle desktop publishing um, and things like that. But again, using large format camera to take photography, we'd been learning all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then following us, the guy you chatted to very recently, I was, that was when I was working, Jake Thornton was editor, basically. Yeah. So I started working the first couple of magazines for you. So Jake was your boss at that point, was he? At that point, Jake was my boss. Well, <laughs> when I started Robin, what is when Robin was editor, yeah, Jake yeah, was basically editor. And then Robin moved away from that into sort of management and, and Jake took over as editor. Um, and yes, I was working for him then. 
and uh, and again picked up loads of stuff. Jake and I were very, you know, we we, uh, we gamed a lot outside, and he was a lot. He introduced me to quite a lot of like Euro games and things. I was always thankful to Jake ah, for that. Ah, taking you to the dark side. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and he always beat me because he's a much better game, and he's a much more diligent about like paying attention to what stats things have got. So he always massive for me the games but it's always quite fun to play um and uh, and stuff and, and various board games and all that kind of stuff so yeah that was great uh so and then i think i was i was only a dwarf for about 80 well the contract ended so <clears throat> i stopped being an assistant games developer and i think my contract was as a white dwarf staff writer mm. but that was for about 18 uh, sorry about another six months to a year so about three years in i think or three and a half years in something like that I went back up to game that finished. That was like my that part of my education, as it were, was finished, and I moved back up to games development. And I've been writing things. I've still been writing rules in White Dwarf, of but not for the main system. But I was doing. I did like Warhammer Quest, Necromunda articles, Epic articles, doing all the battle reports, all that kind of stuff. So I was still doing stuff. We just weren't allowed to write for Warhammer or 40k, basically. Um, although we did some bits for that at the end as well. We were mm. doing characters, and the Empress Champion came out. Anyway. Uh, my first codex, my first proper rules, I'd done some stuff before, was Codex Sister Battle, which was just towards the end of the life of 2nd edition 40k. And then 3rd edition 40k came along, and it was quite... Uh, it's funny, because of the two, I'd probably been, uh, before joining, I was probably more Warhammer, uh, other than playing Space Marine, more Warhammer orientated. I'd started collecting probably more and played more Warhammer. Well, I ended, uh, Thomas Pyrrhon had kind of joined at around about that time, and he was very Warhammer focused, mm -hmm. so he was Warhammer and Alessio de Cavatori yes. again. He he came along around about that sort of time as well from the, the Italian translation team. So they were kind of handling Warhammer. So I ended up basically on the 40k side of things, um, just by that's where the space was. And uh, the Sisters of Battle that was the one with with John Blanche's famous portrait. Yes. That that I mean, it, I remember at the time that it felt like a, a, aesthetically a step back for 40k somehow that it was a step back to a time when 40k was a slightly more grown-up activity or at least yes. aesthetically had that had that more grown-up more edgy feel was that was that something that you or the design studio were conscious of at the time i think there was a little bit of a there was a slight shift there because yeah i mean very much up to that point it had been very it was the red pit what we called the red period yes. yeah, yeah. Um, which you know it had its appeal but very it was quite primary colored um you know space Marines had red bolters goblins had red spears everything had a goblin green base yes including that commander figures um <laughs> which was a thing but anyway uh and so yeah um uh but yeah i, I think um as we moved into third edition 40k and again yes it's slightly i wouldn't i wouldn't say it was necessarily conscious uh i suppose but just the artists that were using and john was getting much more involved mm -hmm. uh, as, as art director then rather than just as you know and stuff like that so i think yeah maybe the, the the graphics and stuff were moving on again in terms of presentation and things uh so but even the narrative yeah, was a, becoming a was becoming a more uh, uh, a taking on I think third edition was possibly the first one that had that grim darkness of the far future expression on the back cover. That, um, that was something that was starting to be embraced more by the design studio then. Yeah, well, I think yeah, I think there's de definitely uh, yeah. Well, things had settled down basically. So you know, up to just before I joined, which is kind of like the, the golden age, as it were. I mean, sort of, which was the age of Brian and the, and, and basically whatever Brian's thought was cool and whatever people came up with so it was all very disorganized but very creative and lots of stuff and 40k was just and warhammer would just you know uh, 40k particularly because it was just kind of being made up as they go it went along really of like oh yeah. uh we're, we're making this cool stuff and adding it in and just releasing stuff yeah uh then and then basically tom took over and rick became product director of product development and he came up with this idea of this four-year plan of each Warhammer and 40k would get renewed, a new edition of box. They'd come up with these box sets, and each one would be redone every four years. Mm. And that was kind of part of the plan, apart from the fact the first one took five years. <laughs> um, but um, uh, so, and, you know, it was just getting organized uh, and stuff. And I think, and a lot of that was a lot of rationalization going on, both in the Warhammer. So, you know, like lots of the Warhammer development had been actually done through Warhammer Fantasy role play. Yeah. Um, so although the, like the Empire Army, I remember the Perry's Empire Army and stuff being released in White Dwarf and stuff, a lot of it hadn't really changed very much from third edition. And then 
uh, and a lot of it was explored mostly with the Wolfram background. And then Rick rationalised a lot of it and to put it into like the Empire Army book and then and the, and the invention of the Army books and the Codex is basically yeah. then qualified and quantified a lot of stuff that had been all over the place. Mm. Um, and and that's when a lot of the red period really started. Mm. And then when we got to third edition, the uh, that was a very sales-driven edition in the sense that uh, they didn't want large codexes. They didn't want, um, uh, you know, the, they wanted the emphasis to be really on the miniatures rather than on the paper product. And stuff. Yeah. So we had, we, we, so we ended up with like the, the really tiny forty-eight page codexes, and yep. things, which meant which meant we just had to rework really smart. It's like, well, we've gone from having like sixteen pages of background to having like three pages of background mm. scattered across them. Um, and also, you know, and tr so trying to put as much as possible into the main rule book, that just as you know, and all that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, did that for a little while. Uh, we that games which I moved, uh, and then became, went onto the campus at Lenton, and yeah. everything kind of changed then as well. Uh, and then it was round about, so it's round about, uh, so nineteen ninety nine, I'd say by this point. So we moved in nineteen ninety seven, I think. Uh, nineteen ninety nine. Uh, we it was when I we pitched uh, the idea of Inquisitor and and sort of like uh, basically Thomas was w working on sixth edition Warhammer which would come out in two thousand and I was working on Inquisitor which came out in two thousand as well um, in, in like the Easter um, and that was so that was basically my first full game was Inquisitor mm -hmm. well, as an only probably thinking about it um, <laughs> although you know sort of worked on lots and lots of games but that's the one with my my name in big on the front yeah um and like i said we can talk about that a bit more we will we will okay. i promise we um, will come back then, to that. then yeah then after sixth edition came out thomas left and went off to do video games and things and basically i inherited the position of warhammer law master hmm. I, I took over the warhammer team uh, with like uh basically a, an empire book a half written orcs and goblins book and a plan for some dwarfs and dark elves range and that was it um and, so, and that was it I, I ended up running warhammer we split the games for them into three teams then so we had uh, andy chambers was the 40k over fiend uh, i was the warhammer law master and alessio cavatori was the lord of the rings ring bearer ah, um okay. uh, and we were doing and, and that was probably that was the peak of games development power, I would say. And was that your yeah. actual job yeah. title then? Was that yeah, yeah, that's what your job that was, description was insisted, Warhammer yeah. Lawmaster? We insisted on our, <laughs> our business cards had Warhammer Lawmaster, Lord of the Rings Ring Bearer and 40k Overfeed. That was part of it. <laughs> we didn't want to be like, you know, well, because the thing is we couldn't, because we were, we were in charge of like, well, in charge of like, <coughs> within the studio yes so like we'd liaise with the you know the artists the miniature designers we did scheduling with the management we were so we so although we weren't necessarily managers although later on we ended up yeah. having staff management roles as well but we didn't do that for but none of, none of you thought we, about what's this going to look yeah. like on my cv when no, absolutely we the absolutely wanted it like... to look like that yeah <laughs> yeah yeah that's the point what's the yeah if you're going to work in games design and stuff like that, there's no point just being like, a, oh, yes, I was Warhammer lead project manager. You know, yeah, that sounds yeah, really yeah. boring. <laughs> I could be lawmaster. Um, I was going to be, I wanted to be um, all father, first of all, but we thought that was a bit too paternal. Oh, okay. um, so, yeah, so we went with lawmaster in it. Uh, yeah, so I did that for a while. Um, and then, and that's when then Jake was working for me. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, writing uh, like High Elvesburg. When he finished it, he ended up finishing off the Orcs and Goblins, actually. Uh, and, and uh, and writing high elves work and stuff and then, and then and then he went sort of like sideways into the whole short order studio thing yeah um after that uh so um and i can't remember how long it was that was one law master then we had a period basically where we had uh what we call was called the key design team which was basically a centralized uh kind of like ip creation management type thing so I was, that's when I became lead background designer, which means I was in charge of the background for 40K and Warhammer. Uh, and Andy was the kind of lead rules, well, lead rules designer. Uh, and then we had, we had jazz and some concept artists and all sorts of stuff. And the idea was we would create material and then the departments would go off and make stuff based on, it was like a mm. bit of an R&D department, but also uh, like uh, we we would we create like world bibles or you know, bibles for the different armies and stuff like that, trying to rationalise the IP a bit and control it a bit more like a grown up business. That didn't last very long. <laughs> um, 
So, uh, how much, how much sort of creative freedom did you have as as the lead for Warhammer Forty Thousand setting? Uh, uh, some. <laughs> I mean, the thing is, uh, throughout this, we had there's still so so, so the the essentially the spirit of Brian lived on, as mm. it were, and and those early things in in the bodies of Rick Priestley, Alan Merritt, and John Blanche. Yes. So Rick Priestley was was lead product. Uh, so was yeah product development direct director of product development. Alan was the IP manager, mm. uh, and John was art director or yeah. art manager um, and stuff like. That. So of course they still had this presence, uh, and they still had massive influence. Mm. It, it, so I didn't necessarily work for any of them directly and we didn't, but of course you'd, they, they were still kind of in charge, especially creatively about what, what happened and what didn't happen. So like Andy and Alessia and I had regular meetings with them, you know, just catch up and stuff and we'll discuss what we were doing. So, uh, and so we were given quite a free reign because we knew what we were doing, but now and again, quite often retrospectively, <laughs> they would make that dis displeasure knowing that we'd gone in the wrong direction and we'd done this or whatever. Um, but, but but at times you know we had, we had a we had a, you know we had a working relationship with them and you know if we were doing conceptualizing stuff you know we'd go off and chat with John and this mm. is when John Park had was ill had a stroke and all sorts of things so mm. there was all kinds of stuff going on but we would go out and visit him at home and he he was doing concept sketches and doing the art direction and and, and so trying to get the, we we were there was a lot of creation going on actually we were reinventing the Bretonians and the Wood Elves. Mm -hmm. um, the Ogre Kingdoms, the Tau, uh, Necrons, all this kind of stuff. There's actually quite a lot of new stuff added yes. over this period between us being in charge of the trials and the Well, creation. that's kind of what I was driving because this was this was a period in which the, the background actually started to expand for the first time in quite a long time. And I wondered whether there were, could, because there was so much new that you came out that Necrons came and got developed and the Tau arrived and got developed. Was there anything you can tell us that Alan put the ban hammer on and went, no, that's that's definitely not happening. I don't think so. That was one of the weird things because the, the, so the Tau, um, I've explained this before, but basically because of Rick's plan, the thing was there'd be a, there's an Easter release and a Christmas release every year. Uh, but actually Rick, uh, well, it was decided that rather than actually having a new 40K box set for this particular Christmas release, put the same amount of resource into a different 40k project, basically into introducing a new army. Mm. So the amount of plastics tooling and design and stuff like that, we go and create something new, add something completely new to 40k, yeah, uh, which would have the same impact as a new edition, but without having to re without all the mm. without having to actually rewrite the game and redo the box set and everything else. Um, so uh, we proposed a bunch of ideas, of which the Tower were one, the Crute were another, the Necrons the Catan and the Demiurge who were like yes. reinvented squads. Um, uh, and we said, you know, and so they were all tied, like five, five different armies at the time or revisiting the Depths Mechanicus was another one. Mm. Um, and as it turned out, of course, the crew ended up in the Tau. Yep. We did the Necrons as well with the Catan yep. and the Demiurge kind of like, made a bit of a through fanatic. Vaguely um, appeared in the background yeah. of the Tau. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, and then the Depths Mechanicus eventually you know, eventually. Came out anyway, so everything's eventually. So you know, most of it happened, but the, but the town was the one that was chosen. Uh, but of course, in the meantime, uh, Games Workshop picked up their Lord of the Rings license. Yes. <laughs> so actually, the studio ended up working on a brand new uh, 40k army and a completely new game based on Lord of the Rings. Mm. Um, so it was busy times, um, and, and that was end up being the Christmas release anyway. Um, so, uh, but that was great, and I think. Uh, so there, yeah, there wasn't anything there that was ever like, no, can't mm. do this, um, and, and uh, so certainly not for games design. Obviously, art and the mini design was all being kind of managed alongside this process, and it, and in the end, uh, it was because uh, lots of management things and, and games actually was trying to grow up differently as well again, and this was when it was really moving into its more corporate structure than mm. it has now. Um, so Tom Kirby was still like chairman and CEO. Well, actually, he wasn't even CEO then. That was no. so he was chairman then. And things, but like there were there were kind of shifts, and there's always been sort of like different forces pulling within Games Workshop yeah. about um, <coughs> basically between um, the, the three major ones being sales, manufacturing, and design. Huh. You know, um, and uh, which is you know uh, which is quite good in a way because you go, there's no point designing stuff that you can't make and sell. But then Quite. on the other hand. 
you don't want to be completely sales led because it's just boring and you end up with things like you know just like okay we have more of the same thing and manufacturing again it's like well it's there's a, manufacturing is, is managed in a different way to a creative process mm -hmm. so these three things were you know but one would be in the ascendancy so when brian was in charge the creative side the studio was king and whatever they said went basically yeah. that's his favorite part of the company uh and then basically when i joined and tom was sort of like uh brought it out sales was very strong because they they were expanding yeah. massively and they were bringing in the money and things like that but actually as that happened then the big problem was with overstocks and all kind of stuff so manufacturing was the key so actually making all this stuff and supplying it and logistics and all the boring stuff of actually making a multi-million pound company work mm -hmm. thing. so so you know these four season stuff were all thing and, and actually the studio um and, and games design in particular have been quite prominent for a long while, but actually, as it, you know, it's like, it's like, well, is that really appropriate that, or, uh, so in the, in the structures that were coming along. So basically key design got broken up. Uh, we went back to games dev. That was around about the time Andy Chambers left. Um, uh, and I ended up, uh, and then basically I ended up working on codexes again. Yeah. Um, uh, and I was doing a bit of work on what would become the, the re-release of Space Hulk. So this was 2000, I mean, you know, this is 2006, five, six now. So we've gone on, you know, lots of stuff's happened, yep. you know, uh, Alessia and I are working on the, basically the demons being relaunched. So we're doing like the, the joint demon codex Warhammer armies with Matt Ward and, and all kinds of other stuff. Fourth edition 40K was the one that kind of changed stuff. So um, we ended up having to kind of, create the 40k background section in about six weeks and stuff because nobody had been keeping an eye on it and <laughs> um uh, so and, and by this point like various people that i'd worked with had left as well so people that i would considered uh like well, friends but also just yeah. like allies within the company and people people like andy but also various sort of andy other, hall i think jake thornton had left at that point as well yeah exactly. yeah well fanatic got broken up jervis came back you know, ronnie like, left around the same time i think ronnie renton no ronnie well uh yeah sort of yeah um paul sawyer as well i think went his own uh, yeah exactly so there's a lot of that there's a lot of changing of the guard and stuff going mm. on and all but also for games workshop's point of view essentially uh, so I was, I was overpaid basically for what they wanted me to do because they were. I was, I was now being paid very, you know, I was paying quite well, well yeah, quite well, um, as a, being a senior games designer who could mm -hmm. run all kinds of stuff. And actually, I was just writing codexes, yeah, or, or, or actually rewriting army books, yeah, as it turned out with like the vampire counts. And, and I had fun with them, and I pushed these things, and I never, I never did anything like less than the best I could do, but essentially they could get somebody literally earning half what I was to do the same job, particularly because there was a process. Yeah. Uh, and I, I was told before, the thing is, everything's part of a process. And there's, uh, when you're working at Games Workshop, there's whole departments to make things cool. Mm -hmm. and there's a whole editorial and production and all the rest of it. So, so um, even if you've got quite creative and control and everything else, the chances of it screwing up are very minimal. Yeah. You can't ball you know but also it does it also mean that if you if you're right and got the right kind of basic skills and stuff you can kind of slot into that machine mm -hmm. into the sausage machine as you say exactly as, as but you, that bit, you, know. you do have the the risk that everything ends up being designed by committee oh yeah, uh, which yeah, yeah. eliminates the the possibility often of of those flights of genius that could cut either way but at the same time they're they're kind of i mean going back to right at the beginning at brian Ansel's uh, uh, leadership it was all flights of genius <laughs> yeah, absolutely yeah yeah definitely i remember one of the stories of alan was uh, like brian coming back in around mccairs and he's writing some more, more stuff and it was literally in green felt tip you know this kind of like that then that's something had to transcribe and, <laughs> and make sense um so yeah well it, it, exactly and there was so there was a change of guard even and rick left at that point as well yes you know um so <coughs> So, and I was actually suffering from depression, I realized later, hmm. after I left. And, and work was one of the reasons, but not just, and it was, you know, it was like life, general and depression is depression. So, um, and not handling it very well, actually. So I had a couple of fairly, you know, uh, it, it wasn't bad. Like I said, the projects day to day, it's, it's like depression, you know, it's like nothing was terrible and stuff like that, but it just wasn't, it's like I had less creativity, less freedom and was doing less interesting things than when I started 14 yeah. years earlier. 
So I wasn't that happy. The uh, Games Workshop wasn't necessarily that happy in terms of like, well, we're paying you this much amount of money to do this much. Um, you know, Alessio took less hours. He started working like a four day or three day week or something mm -hmm. and stuff like that to, to not get kicked out. So we came to an arrangement, which was generally mutual of like, uh, okay, right, time to go, I think. You know, it's, uh, mm -hmm. uh, we'll give you a bit of money to set you on the way. They were very good. They set me up with like an employment consultant for they had five sessions of an employment consultancy and stuff to help me get on my way and stuff like that. Um, and then he said, screw that, I'm going to write novels. Well, the, 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 it was the employment consultant that helped me do it, actually. It was literally one of those things where he sat down and he said, he said that awful question of like, oh, where do you see yourself in five years? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I literally saw myself sitting at a keyboard. You know, I, I visualized it. And I was like, I see myself sitting at a keyboard. And, and that was when I was saying writing novels rather than designing games, because mm. it was a flip, really. This was <coughs> the day job was writing games uh, and like the Black Library stuff, which had started in 19. 98 i think yeah, uh, yeah. so I've, you know, I've been writing for nearly 10 years already for black library then but um uh you know that was like, like a hobby a paid hobby evenings and weekends and so i've kind of flipped them basically these days and i'm i'm I, you know most of what i do is writing for black library and writing fiction and things like that and then i do some games design as well you know about 20 percent of the time um and particularly for myself it's just more of a hobby although it'd be nice to get stuff published and whatever it's just I enjoyed doing it back to like it was before I joined Games Workshop. Yeah, and it's kind of been a long process to get there actually, um, in terms of <coughs> being part of the big machine, being part of the inside, and and in everything, like I say, being the, one of the spiders at the centre of the web, to being on the outside, mm. it was very, uh, it was a breakup, you know. I make the analogy, and 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 the relationship to the hobby and Games Workshop and everything went through some transitions at that time. It's in a, I'm in a very good place with it now, but it's like. It's it's hard watching stuff that you were intrinsically involved with, mm. then going up from directions that you, that you agree with or don't agree with. It doesn't matter. Suddenly you're just a punter. Yeah. Only I wasn't because I was still working with Black Library as well. well so quite. You're maintaining a relationship both professionally and personally with these people. Um, so yeah, and so to say, basically that was it. That was 2008. I left Games Workshop. So so 13 years ago. Is that 13 years ago? It yeah. is now. So all, I'm almost now out of Games Workshop as long as I was there. Yeah. In another year, uh, March next year, I'll have been out as long as I was in, mm. which is interesting um, as a thought because it doesn't feel that long. And uh, uh, but you go, it's actually, you know, uh, it feels like I left a few years ago, but I didn't. <laughs> it's, it's over a decade ago. Now. That's right. And when you talk about stuff like coming out in 2000, again, it's like. That's twenty one years. years ago. I know. I know. For those of our generation, <laughs> this is, this is a little bit mind blowing because the year two thousand sat as this big thing in our in Absolutely. our existences, and now now it's just it was ages ago. That was a long time ago. So so now you're predominantly writing novels, of course, and predominantly yeah. writing novels for the Black Library. But you do have a a non Black Library fantasy series as well that you've. Written. Yes, I had the cut of the blood. That was uh, for Angry Robot. Which, which I'm, a, I have to admit, I literally only just found out about when I was researching your website before <laughs> this interview. I was like, oh, crap, there's a Not Games Workshop series I must read. Um, yeah. So I will have to get onto that. Is, um, I can send you some. I've got some fair copies. I'll send you some. Oh, Sorry? Is Mark Gascoigne yeah. still leading at uh, Angry Robot? He was an editor. No, he isn't. No, Mar Mar no, Marco. So Marco, uh, Angry Robot had a, bit of a, it's had a bit of a tumultuous time. So mm -hmm. it was uh, originally set up as an imprint of HarperCollins. Yeah. But actually, before they released anything, HarperCollins sold them and they went to Osprey. Mm, so Osprey right, owned yes. Angry Robot for a while. And then uh, they bought Osprey. And then, yeah, exactly. And then they've moved and they're now owned by, are they called... I can't remember what they're called now, but they're basically they're another publisher slash kind of bookshop sort of place down in London, right. Warrington or something like that. Yeah. Um, so they still get Angry Robot still goes strong, but now Marco left. I think when he departed, when they moved from Osprey, hmm. he now works for Asmodee Entertainment. He's doing ah, the same. Okay. He's, he's basically doing round three because he's <laughs> actually set up, set up Black Library for Games Workshop, set up Angry Robot for Half Collins, and now he's setting up basically the book line for Asmodee Entertainment. Ah, um, okay. So, and pretty much with some of the same authors as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's all it's all a clothes shop, isn't it? We know how it works. Yeah, <laughs> well, that, was, that, was, that, was, that was it. I mean, I got to write for Black Library because I sat three desks down from Andy Jones when he set up Black Library, yeah. and he was he said, and I'd been doing quite a lot of color text and stuff. And he said, "Are you interested in writing a short story uh, for when they 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 they, they, were doing, they opened with a magazine called Inferno?" I remember. Um, and then, and then from that, you know, I got into the fiction writing side of stuff, mm. and then. 
when I left Games Workshop, and it just happened to be the same time when Marco was setting up Angry Robot, and of course he was just, so he was after authors, and I was kind of, my, my Black Library schedule hadn't filled up to fill a full-time job then, because literally it was in like the two months after I'd left, so I was writing Malekith, um, so I had a job, I actually had a job to do, which was good, a paying job, plus what Games Workshop gave me, but he's like, well, do you want to pitch a novel series to us? So I pitched The Crown of the Blood. Um, so that that's how that happened, you know. It was like, again, right place, right time. Sorry, you can't learn anything from my experience unless you're just going to get lucky. <laughs> well, that's something to be learned. I, to be fair, that is something it, to be learned. It, it, yes, it, yeah. It, you know, it, I, I didn't have the right place. Pilot. The only way to be in the right place at the right time is to put yourself in a lot of different places all of the time. That helps, yes. Well, and exploit. You know, it's like once you have an opportunity, you have to make the most of it. Yeah. I think that's the thing. It's like you have to grasp grasp that opportunity and make sure you make the most of it which is hopefully what I did with the crown of the blood you know I, I yeah. tried to uh, he didn't have to commission it it wasn't like a, it wasn't a done deal mm. it's like it was an opportunity to pitch right. a series and make it work and, and write a novel that they wanted yeah. um, so I just skipped the step of the slush pile really and, and agent um, so uh, yeah so that's but, but then obviously I've still got it's it's hard because of course for, for basically at least about at least one, maybe two generations now of Games Workshop fans. I am a writer. I'm not yeah. a games writer. Um, and then there's uh, because I joined it. I was 19 when I started, which is a you know a very tender age. Um, and so there's a weird thing for me as well. Of people round about the same age as me, but say, oh, I grew up with you. Yeah. You're like you're literally like two years younger than me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but they were 17 when I was in White or 18 when I was in White Dwarf yes. and write the games they were playing and things like that because I started so young. So I have this weird disconnect, uh, you know, and, and whereas actually, you know, and the people that I look up to, like, were Andy, I got to work with Jazz and Andy Chambers and stuff and also Rick and yes. the, the, that, that age before as well. But people then look up to me and go, but, but yeah, you have it. <laughs> It's funny. Uh, uh, one of the other patrons and, and podcasts I like is Henry Hyde's one. Yes, yes. And, he, and again, That's the experience awesome. of so many people uh, of that kind of era is almost exactly the same of getting into the Games Workshop or or it was like or Hero Quest or whatever. Um, and yet, those few years difference, yes, and actually getting the job made such a yeah. difference to my life. Yeah. It was a real sliding doors moment. Really, I have no idea where my what those last twenty years, would, thirty years would be like. 20 years, sorry, at 25 years, <laughs> if that had not happened. So, um, when I chat to people, we have very similar experiences right up until that point. You yes. know, it's like, when I say people, they played Facebook, they're playing Space Hulk, they're playing it was exactly the same games as I was, maybe a couple of years younger than I was at the time, but that was it. And then, but I became this feature of their lives, weirdly, through all this persona of me, anyway, through White Dwarf and stuff. And, um, <coughs> but now there's a whole bunch of people that it's not true for. Yeah. Which is I'm out, you know, it's like, I'm out now. Um, yes. and, now I'm, and what's interesting, and I, I discussed this in my episode with Jake, is that, yes, you're right that there's now a generation of, of war gamers to whom you're, you're, I don't want to say just an author, but, but your role is as an author in the Black Library series and you've got no influence on their, their gaming life. But nobody has really replaced that generation of, of you and Jake and Alessio and Thomas and, and Andy, you know, to, to us at that time, those of us who were playing, those names had significance. But Games Workshop's new persona is that no one person gets that kind of headline yeah. exposure. So, so there is no new generation of designers to inspire new people coming through to do the same thing. Yeah, and to find right. that you've got to look outside Games Workshop. You've got to look to to Even Sorensen. You've got to look to Chris Bunch at Modifius. You know, you've got to look to um, some of the authors at Fantasy Flight who do get some kind of name recognition or used to. But even so, it, it, it's becoming harder to find role models. Yeah, in the industry that... to inspire a new generation of designers. Yes, absolutely. I think. Um... Yeah, I mean, I, I, I understand on the one hand that, you know, sort of like Games Workshop is quite wary about the cult of personality yeah. and stuff. Uh, and nobody's bigger than the company, all the rest of that kind of stuff. Uh, and, you know, and there are, re and also actually, particularly uh, on the miniature design side of stuff, it's like, it's massively expanded. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, there were, what, 12 designers, I think, maybe when I left, and they've got like, what, 30 or 40 
people now in the Citadel design team, and obviously, but I think, yeah, you're right. I think there's there 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 is that lack of continuity. The people that we know, like like say John and Rick and Mike McVeigh and yeah. uh, and, and and every metal painters, you know, again, who did they look up to when when yeah. When you're, you know, there's the golden demon windows and stuff. But if you, if you want to be an heavy metal painter, so like, you know, we work again. Uh, the heavy metal painters worked with guys like Stu Thomas. Like I said, Mike, that's when Mike Vey was still there, uh, and Neil Hodgson and Dave Perry and 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 uh, and they were known. Yeah. You know, they could, Whereas they, now, if you, you want know, a, a name you know painter, painter yeah, yeah, if you want a name painter, you're looking at people like Jose Da Vinci and Angel Geraldes who are who are working outside Games Workshop and working for for other companies. Yes. Because because that's that's now where you find name recognition in the industry is anywhere but Games Workshop, which is which is interesting or, or, because it's not like yeah. GW's not still producing high quality content. No, no, absolutely. I think that I, I think that's the thing, and. Uh, but like I said, I think partly because it is just part of this sausage machine in the best possible way. I mean that as well. There is, you know, it's like there is just a minimum standard that everything's going to mm. uh, 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 attain, just because it, it it will. But I think yes, that that idea that that kind of like the the, the process rules rather than the individual. I mm. think that's the and it isn't quite designed by committee yet. I don't think because. Um, that would be because death. that would be death. Design well, by committee I, is instant instant death to anything. But it's, yeah, and, well, if, and the thing is, it depends on who's on the committee and what they do and how mm. you run it and stuff like that. So we had committees as a such, but we would start off like say, remember doing Yoga Kingdoms, but the people in the room was a concept artist, a miniature designer, and a games designer. Mm. It wasn't a bunch of managers deciding what was on the schedule. Quite, uh, and 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 that's still kind of there because the Citadel Miniatures team still kind of leads the way hmm. in essence and there's still and there's a weird arrangement i don't know exactly how it works because it's not actually a separate bit it's not actually part of the james Workshop design studio which makes the books and things yeah. and stuff so um so and it's a bit like almost when i started in the days of brian when it's like we've made these toy soldiers go and write some background and some yeah. so there's obviously a bit more interaction than that yeah. i mean literally my first job for writing rules was a squat cyclops so there's this bit the miniature for epic which basically andy put on my table and said you need to write rules for that yeah, going in white dwarf. Yeah, and I was like, okay. And there was a few times that kind of happened, where it's like, well, miniatures design have written these rules. Uh, sorry, design these miniatures. They need to be incorporated into the game. Yeah. And then for a long while, uh, again, possibly too far the other way. Games design, like I said, we were kind of because uh, we were the most organised of any department. Mm. People, you know, just like the least arty in fact, because we, we were de facto project managers a lot of the time and things like that. We got to control a lot of the process for a while. Mm. So, uh, so working with management about what was on the design schedule. And again, it was never about just telling people what to draw or what to, they were, they were always involved in that process. Mm. And we tried to conceptualize ideas with miniature designers and things. But we, I suppose, but the guy that writes the notes, the guy that writes the minutes has the control, you yeah. know, of what yeah, yeah. was inside. Always. Yeah. Um, and, and we were just kind of like the ones that were doing that. So, uh, we, we were one that pushed the process through and mm. so made it work. So and that was slightly different. But when you're dealing with like Jez Goodwin or Brian Nelson stuff, you don't tell them what to sculpt no. or how to sculpt. You know. <laughs> dig, you know. Um, but what you do is you sit down with management and some guy from marketing and so you've done lots of conceptualization and then you look at it and go, what do we need as a range plan? Uh, but anyway, so the, the whole thing, I say, I, I would say my experience from Games Workshop is massive in terms of it didn't, I didn't just learn how to design games. I think that's my big takeout from it, and I look at what other people do, uh, and how and how you know it's like there's very little opportunities to do what I did. Even mm. now, in terms of working with editorial teams, and working with production teams, working with designers, working with artists, working with marketing departments, working with sales guys, uh, in a, in such a way that actually I can't do any of those bits myself necessarily. I wouldn't say I was a project manager, although I can manage projects. And I'm definitely not an artist or administrative designer, but I know enough of those things and enough of those disciplines to have valuable input on them and be able to recognize or, or be able to interact with them. If yeah. you see me. So, um, and you can almost not get that anywhere else. There yeah. isn't a game company anywhere else that you can get that. And, and that like, level with those types of people, mm. so you can you know you can spend all the time in the world working with a sculptor or an artist or, or something like that. But actually, just just deliberately from the moment I was there, the whole point was to be educated on the entire process of making a game. Mm. 
and a miniatures game at that. Uh, and that's what I've been able to take away from it, I suppose. Um, whereas actually quite, like I say, you know, you can write your own games rules, they can get, you know, I mean, I don't know what quite what the process was for you and Osprey, for instance, and how that works. And obviously you, you haven't, you, you didn't, you know, you got to write a miniatures game and work with people making a game, but you had no control. You didn't have to, although you had to think about the miniatures, there was, there's like a wall there. There's like, you have no, literally no control over making any miniatures or, or being able to design it. Quite exactly the opposite. I had no control over what miniatures people were going to use to play the game. Yeah. So I had to try and write a game anticipating the full scope of miniatures people might want to use and, and design from that principle. And I, and I had to draw lines. I had Occasionally I had to go, oh, should I not allow for this, this, or this? And I'd have, no, no, that's just too silly. We're not going to do that. That's, that's, yeah. that's not part of the game. And I, I think just that, had to make those decisions. And I think what I find... Uh, getting out of that, trying to what I find difficult is actually getting out of that process now. Yeah. That because um, I'm very kind of, as I say, I'm a kind of problem solving, kind of quite goal orientated in terms of what I do. Even my writing and things, it's like, well, what's your brief? Uh, and I can I can create to that, and I can solve the problems that are required for that. Whereas whenever someone says, oh, what do you want to do? What games? You know, it's like I, I the games I designed for myself. I'm like. I don't know what games do I like. What do I want to do? Well, where, where, where is my hobby? What? And it's taken me a long time to find some of those things again. So people say, "Oh yeah, imagine you had a million pounds, you could make any game." You go, "Well, that doesn't help." My brain doesn't. Well, my brain doesn't think like that either. Because yeah. like, well, okay, we're we talking pure vanity project or something that's actually commercial or you know, mm. da, 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 that those fourteen years have inculcated a certain type of thinking. Yeah my head uh, which is quite regimented in a way but also you know so very useful but also quite constraining because yeah. i'm so used to working as part of the process so just making up a game and not trying to think about the commercial consequences or how does that work or how we're going to get it doesn't occur to me and I'm, I'm trying to get some of that indie kind of like individuality back into my thinking about games and things mm -hmm. and not worry you know and thinking because uh, and the industry itself has gone more that way, I think. And it's, it's kind of divided, really. But actually, much more of it is still about, there's quite a lot of things that seem to be very expensive to make. Yes. And hard to make, especially Kickstarter and, <laughs> and uh, digital publishing and all this kind of stuff has kind of pushed the boat out in terms of just production quality is massive for lots of games. Um, but on the other side, and I've been looking particularly at role-playing games and stuff, there's a there's a burgeoning indie scene of, of like... Uh, just very cheap. I, I always kind of compare it to things like um, uh, the like laser burn and reaper and, yes. and rudis and stuff. So these little A5 folded pamphlet rules and things. That's kind of coming back now. And I would like to try and do something like that for war games again. So there's a, there's this cool growing indie video game and RPG scene, but I don't yeah. see it. Uh, I don't think it's quite there for war games. So for example, you know, you do uh, Zero Dark. Yeah. And you're aspiring to that level of production, which is great. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that you shouldn't be doing that, um, but I'm saying for me, actually, because I've been involved in that process, for me, actually, it'd be really nice not to do that, just to do something punky, dirty, which quick, is more really 80s almost yeah, kind of like, which is much just, more like even Sorensen at, at Nordic Weasel, even though his his yeah. Parsecs has been turned into a nice shiny package by, <laughs> by Modiphius. Actually, his main sort of uh, 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 stable of games are very stripped down aesthetically speaking it's yeah. just text on a page and, and you just yeah. absorb the text and play the game yes whereas yeah. i and went in very much consciously from the start saying no no i want high production qualities i want art i want photography i i want high, high quality layout now i've got yeah. to go and learn how to do that yes yeah absolutely and i think that's there's advantages and disadvantages there's like you're setting this to do that you're uh i think because we do have a very aesthetically clued up audience these days. So actually most people are looking for that. You know, they want a nice, nice looking book on, you know, uh, and actually that's going to draw them in more than something that, uh, and then, then hopefully the content's there. Uh, I think the indie thing is a little, is a niche of a niche, which mm. is always a bit dangerous, but I think it's quite loyal and it's quite, and they're very, you know, intra supportive, um, generally and so but i don't know and the thing is that's quite exciting for me i want to find out i want to just do something if you see I me mean, with very little expectation um in terms of 
uh, you know, I want to see what I'd come up with. Yeah, basically. I think I'd like to see what you'd come up um, with. And, and uh, well, that's the thing. But just trying to find the, time, the the one thing it takes is time. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And so, and so, we, going back to you know, like game design and spare time, it's like uh, there is always that. You know, the ideas ideas aren't too difficult. Working them up a little bit isn't too difficult. Testing them and getting game time is more tricky, especially in current circumstances over yeah. over last year uh you know which is why you know i, I went okay. to <laughs> well that's that was one of the things that uh, that's literally was it and, and what kind of attracted me to the patreon and doing was the solo aspect of um zero dawn um and 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 seeing what you've done with it there and knowing your pedigree from like the inquisitor stuff and knowing and having sort of like that style of game and i was thinking about that kind of game as well of like you know and then, and it was like, oh, actually, there's almost like a ready-made thing here. Okay, oh, that's quite interesting. I'll have a look at that. Maybe somebody's done my job for me. <laughs> but, um, and uh, and it is, I think. And again, when it when it comes back down to, and what I'm thinking is like, but it's just dice and cards and miniatures mm -hmm. and a rule book. There isn't lots and lots of bits. Yeah. Uh, and I think, and for for various reasons, like production costs, shipping these days, but also just uh, part of me is like uh, just a kind of as a purist ideal of just like actually yeah i don't want to do lots of special dice and mm. uh and and um uh, lots of expensive upfront costs and things but also just lots of paraphernalia that people have to invest in where you go actually i'd like to just get ideas out of write a cool set of rules that just use what gamers have the old uh, i always like the uh, one another one that jake introduced me to which was the cheap ass games yes you know, of course, they started to do like special editions and yeah. nice versions of, again. But yeah, James, James Ernest, like, well, you've got pawns, you've got dice, you've got things. So here's a board and some cards and a really cool, fun set of rules. That was the thing. Again, it's the, the idea, I suppose, of content is is king over presentation. The presentation has to be legible and of a certain level, but it's actually the experience of playing it is the, is the most important thing. So yeah, um, and I think... Uh, so that's where I'm at. It's like I, I, it's quite easy to design large, sprawling, expensive games. I think and when I say quite easy, meaning I've gone through that process many, many times. Yeah. And if, if somebody can give you the money and the time to do it, it's not. It's not. You're not doing anything different. If you see me. For me, like writing a short story is probably actually hard. Trying to get something into a short story is harder than writing a full novel in a sense. Not not time wise, but just like. Okay, I've only got five thousand words to play with. Not ninety thousand. It. Yes. It's like you've only got, you know, it's like you've got six pages of rules, and and you can only use these sixes. Go and design a game mm -hmm. is a challenge, you know. Um, and open combat was a bit like that as well. A challenge. Oh, I was going to say yeah. it's a great yeah. example of exactly what you're you're you, talking about. You, you, know? you write a set of rules. I mean, again, he ended up with a nice big hardback book and everything. Else. It's like, can you basically set up, making certain assumptions about what people know? Can you write a set of rules on two on two sides of A4? Hmm. Um, and he could, you know, um, so, and, and I like that kind of thing, I think, because I can't, individually, I can't compete with Games Workshop and Modifius and things like that. I could work for them, but if I want the ownership that I'd want, I need to set that that bar lower, mm. if you and mm -hmm. by lower, it's been more achievable physically <laughs> and, and like financially, I guess. So speaking of speaking of, of game designs, and we're nearly an hour in, so this seems like the right time to... to pull this topic back to inquisitor <laughs> yes yeah um now to me inquisitor still stands out as a game unlike anything else that games workshop did before or since i mean really the closest equivalent is original warhammer 40,000 road trader um, designed to emulate, basically. Yeah, and and, <laughs> I, and I'm, it's when it happened that makes me initially curious. Now, just just for the quick benefit of our listeners, and I'll save your voice because you've been talking so much. Um, Inquisitor is a narrative skirmish game in that it's it's a skirmish miniatures game, like any skirmish miniatures game, but instead of having army points or missions or any restrictions on what the players can do they're supposed to come up with a story that dictates what's going on on the table and then whatever they have to complete or participate in that story is whatever they use and 
It was published by Games Workshop, if I remember rightly, in 2001. And I'm thinking 2001 because I received my copy of Inquisitor sitting in a um, porter cabin in Shipovo in Bosnia, <laughs> where I was commanding a medical troop at the time. And and my experience when the game when the game arrived in the parcel, I got to unpack it and read it for the first time. My first reaction, and I think this is true of many people, was what the hell am I reading? <laughs> that there was aesthetically, and, and, and as you say, the, the aesthetic design of it was, was outstanding and the setting and the background and the characters and the amazing was amazing. And I was like, this is, this is fantastic. And then I read the rules and I go, my, my brain cannot compute what I am reading. And I think it probably took me I mean, certain, certainly, I can remember because that was that was at the early end of two thousand and one. At the back end of two thousand and one, I was then in in Oman, um, in the desert for three months, and it wasn't until after I came back from Oman that I finally reached out to the Inquisitor community to say, "What is this game? I, I do not understand. I mean, I love it, but I don't understand it." And my impression has always been since then that, that there really was a dichotomy of response to Inquisitor, that on the one hand you had some people who went, I don't understand this, but I love it, I'm going to try and work it out. And other people who went, I don't understand this, I'm not going to give this any more of my attention. Um, and and as a result, it, I mean, we talked about that early days of creativity in Games Workshop. And the later, the red period where everything was much more structured, much more sales oriented, much more guided. And yet Inquisitor falls at the end of that red period and, and feels like a product out of the creative period. So my main question to you is, how did you ever get them to agree to let you write it? So, um, so as I was explaining before, so Rick had a plan, and there was say there were two releases a year, and they'd been they'd been doing this for a while, really. If we, if we look back at it, but basically there was an Easter release and a Christmas release, mm -hmm. and the Christmas release was always a big one. So it's either so basically it was either 40k or Warhammer or something significant enough. So Necromunda was one, and it was always 28 mil. Mm. Yeah. So again, the the received wisdom, um, talking about you know Space Marine being in fun and stuff like that. But the received wisdom was always that 20, you know from Brian's days onwards was that. Uh, 28 mil sells the best and other stuff doesn't sell quite as well yeah. which you know I don't know whether it's self-fulfilling prophecy or not but it was kind of true um, you know it wasn't just completely made up so 28 mil game uh, uh, in the Warhammer Warhammer 40,000 universe at Christmas something else at Easter <clears throat> and so that included things like Battlefleet Gothic Maud uh, Mordheim was uh, a 28 mil so that was yeah I think Mordheim must have been a, a Christmas release was it? I don't know. It was quite. I can't remember now. I it think it was. Up. Yeah, it might have been a Christmas release. Um, but then, but then, Epic, Epic Forty Thousand, Titan Legions, uh, all of those, Blood Bowl. I think were all Easter releases. Um, and so, Easter two thousand and one. You're right. It was two thousand one, not two thousand. Um, uh, which was which is why because I'd taken over as Warhammer Lore Master and because it hadn't actually wasn't actually out. So I was doing. I was, I had the twin role of trying to learn how to be Warhammer Lawmaster whilst doing all of the kind of like rollout content for White Dwarf and things like that for Inquisitor. Um, but basically, we, as we're done with the aliens thing, the new army thing, since we had a slot and they and uh, uh, the like Rick and that just said, okay, what do you want to do there? You know, we'll let you, we'll decide, but you pitch us some ideas. So Game Dev, we all sat in a room. A meeting room and we had spent about two hours and we just came up with as many different ideas as we could and then we each were given one as a, just or two, one or two each that so we'd write up the pitch and kind of be championed for um and uh, there was stuff in there i mean there was like uh doing um uh, like a 40k pirates space pirates mm -hmm. boarding action game uh, uh there was doing dark future but in 10 mil uh, like more of a battle game. Mm -hmm. um, there was um, uh, all, all kinds of stuff, basically. I can't remember all of them now. And one of them was, uh, which was actually kind of suggested by Jervis, but I ended up being like champion for it, which was uh, Jervis is always a fan of 54 mil Wild West skirmish gaming, which was something that was quite big in like the 70s, early 80s, yes. um, and, and various rule sets and stuff. Uh, and so 
and I was kind of vaguely aware of this sort of thing. Again, it's sort of that pamphlet rule book type thing, um, and and the idea being that you'd have your gang of cowboys or bandits or uh, American Indians or Mexicans or whatever, and you'd have four or five of them and they'd have names and, and stuff, and then you'd fight out and you'd you'd fight out a, a skirmish between them, and then you would record what happens and you'd play a campaign, and but very narrative, mm. very story driven rather than aha, this is a very pre-formatted scenario. So that was the idea of doing doing that in 40k and then i came up with so the layer i put onto it was the, uh, trying to find a format for that within 40k that would work but i came up originally it was the idea of inquisitors fighting chaos magi mm -hmm. so it's under the side inquisitor in his little war band against chaos magi and his cult and they would fight um and, and this so and the upper, the higher ups liked that um a lot and so and so at the same time so they kind of uh, started commissioning. They got the Perrys to make some trial. Mm -hmm. They were released eventually, I think, actually through Fanatic, but did some trial 54 mil Imperial Guard yep. models. Uh, and Alan was going away and having some ideas about it. And Rick was thinking about the background I proposed. And John Blanche started just doing bad sketches for things. Um, and then so we settled. And it was settled on. We only had 15 miniatures for the range. Mm. So, oh, sorry. So Games Workshop is a miniatures company that writes games for miniatures. Yes, it's always as I always company. say, it's a miniatures yeah. company that writes games, that publishes yeah, games. absolutely. Which doesn't devalue the games, and they they take the games very seriously, but the miniatures come first. Yeah. And so in, in this instance, the, what they really liked about it was the idea of doing a range of 54 mil, highly detailed, collectible miniatures. Mm. Yeah. So that's what I mean by the miniatures come first. Yes. So, and then, and then we'd write a cool game that then would people could use those miniatures in. But actually, it's like, yeah, great. Actually, yeah, 54 mil, new range of miniatures. Um, that'd be cool. But then for, for me, it was like, actually, this doesn't, the background didn't quite work because we'd have to have goodies and baddies. We only had 15 miniatures. There wasn't really the flexibility there because it wasn't quite, it's not quite like role playing where you could just make up whatever. Quite. Um, there's still a there's still a physical miniatures element. That's what's always important about miniatures game is remembering, moving stuff around on the table, collecting and painting some toy soldiers. So, uh, uh, so we I came up with this idea of this internal ongoing kind of war, cold war type thing within the Inquisition itself. So the idea that all 15 models could be used by anybody. Yeah. So there was basically only one faction. Yeah. And, and which is cool. And most of the best stuff in games workshops start like that. You know, the Horus Heresy exists. So that people could use the same Titans and Space Marines yes. models, yeah. Yes. Um, so you know, because it only had one mold, and uh, and then and Rick kind of really picked up that, and he and he, he did a document which was basically uh, he came up with this just basic idea of the Puritans and the Radicals. Uh, it just wrote a couple of paragraphs of kind of this idea, and and, and kind of expanded on a few of the things that I'd kind of pit, put in the pitch. Uh, and then I took that away, and then and then we were off and running. Basically, this mm. was a project that we're going to do. It. it had a slot, so I started. I started uh, very deliberately. I wanted to to uh, recreate some of the feel of Rogue Trader. Yep. Um, with D100 tables. It was deliberately <laughs> old school. I was very aware of more modern styles of gaming, but it was like, no, this is, I'm going to tug on those strings. It's like, if I'm designing this game, uh, then actually cool D100 tables, scenario tables, even some of the scenarios, actually I, I cribbed from the original scenario tables in Road Trader, just tweaked them and updated yeah. them and stuff like that. Um, uh, and uh, and then John was just doing this crazy, fantastic art for different characters. Uh, Alan came up with this list of just titles of things, like you know, Chrono Gladiators and Arco Flagellants. Yes. So we started matching, and John took some of that, and I started adding background to these things. And at the same time, started working on the rule set. Um, and the rule set being, uh, you know, Jervis brought in his copies of the things so I could see, you know, like these these. Uh, so like 1980s cowboy 54 mil cowboy skirmish rules and various other 54 mil rules mm. that you have and I and this was you know again very different environment to games much today you know I was on I think it's Andrea miniatures to do with lots yes. of 54 mil so I was, yes. you know was on the website again internet new newish pretty much still in 2000 yeah um, and the idea of a web store um, very new um, in fact I didn't have a web store I remember I actually ended up having to order their catalogue. <laughs> I was looking through the Andrea miniatures and then ordering some cool models from Andrea and some 136 scale kits and stuff and just basically kit bashing some models yeah. to we start playtesting with. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, and then it kind of came together, really, I suppose. It's just, uh, we got, 
you know, John really, really got involved in the art side of it for the first time in like, well, more time was the other one again where he got really involved in it. You can, Which you can tell shows. You know, his influence is on stuff, can't you? When yeah. he, when uh, you know, um, and so, so there basically there was a, a me and John got to work together quite a lot on stuff. He was just creating his cool sketches. I was writing bits of background that he was then reading and uh, and finding, uh, you know. Not necessarily drawing what was in those things, but just absorbing this idea of this world we were, this underbelly of the Imperium that we were creating, mm. and and the, and the and then you know, but then when we made a couple, of, you know, we started looking at the actual range. So like, okay, we're gonna have three. We had three archetypes for the different Inquisitors, uh, and then and basically it was also just like like the miniatures designers, <coughs> they're gonna get you know like basically one of these models each. Maybe somebody will get two. Jed's got two, because who else was going to design a space marine? Yeah. You know? um, one of the things like that, again, yeah, we know it's different. It's going to be, you know, stuff, but we'll be stupid not to make a 54 mil space marine. Going back to the miniatures come first, it's like, yeah. we'll want to, you know, they may never play the game. They may, they will want to own and paint a 54 mil space marine. But again, it was all about not doing stuff that would appear on the 40k battlefield. <laughs> um, so the idea of the Death Watch, you know, this idea that space marine, so people could paint it any chapter they wanted, but actually also no chapter at all, mm. you know. Uh, so because we didn't want to make an ultramarine, you know, we didn't want to hedge people in by saying this is an ultramarines captain or something like that, something that you could just port directly from 40k. And the same reason, even though Inquisitors were kind of in 40k uh, and Imperial Guard in 40k, it's like, no, these are all got to be twists on those archetypes or com new things completely that are just for Inquisitor. And of course, over the years, they've all been ported back into 40k. Yes. Um, so you now get units of Arco Flagellants and Death Cultists and armies of Death Watch and all kinds yeah. of other stuff, which I, I, you know, I, I, I think is great, actually. I mean, I, it's, uh, I, it, doesn't, cause it doesn't really spoil where they came from. I don't mm. think that, that that's happened. And that's its legacy, I think, even though because the game um, obviously isn't uh, an ongoing thing for Games Workshop now. The effect that had on 40k on the psyche of, of lots of 40k players who maybe even never played it, but also just on the universe itself and and some of the other bits continue to echo. Those ideas that we came up with are still part of the 40k universe now. Massive parts of the 40k universe still. You know, whole role-playing games based off the Death Watch, you know, uh, and all that kind of stuff. Arco Flagellants, and then they've turned them into big, more, you know, like weird big engines. And so again, those ideas continue to expand and ripple out into the 40k universe. Um, and uh, yeah, and I sort of like decided, you know, again, just to, for that nod of role playing games stuff, like let's make it a D one hundred system because hey, percentages are cool, <laughs> you know, and things like that. And well, and again, it's different. It's like D tens in a game, yeah. you know. It's like whereas Games Workshop, apart from Jervis um, using D twelves in Advanced uh, Space Crusade and Advanced Hero Quest for some reason. Oh wow, I don't um, remember that. Yeah, you are liked it for some reason. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. D12. Dice of the Gods, obviously. Yeah, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Now, now this is better than the D10. This is two better than the D10. Exactly. Um, uh, so, um, so that was very much at the heart of it, of just trying to have a. Uh, it's it, basically Inquisitor is a role playing combat system, yeah. which assumes you have miniatures. Yeah, it comes out to, and it has, and again, something that was in Rogue Trader, but never, never really was portrayed particularly in White Dwarf stuff, but it had a Games Master. Yes. Yeah. But actually, it very quickly developed away from that with Army Lists and that kind of stuff. Um, and so very deliberately, you could, if you've got two players who know what they're doing and kind of play in a certain way, then you don't need a Games Master to play Inquisitor. You know, you can come up with a scenario together and stuff like that. But it's fun to have a Games Master because you can yes. have NPCs and unexpected things, you know, like you can in a role-playing game, mm. you know. Some role playing games these days and just mutual storytelling games. Exactly. Uh, and, and Inquisitor can do that. Yeah. Um, but actually, just again, that idea of having a games master, which again made it more difficult to play because it's like, yeah. well, you need a third player. And the other thing which I think really counted against it was, was terrain. Mm. So, like, figures and stuff people could get their heads around. Um, but because you always wanted a, such a, you know, and actually for forty k, if you end up playing over the same terrain again and again and again, it was fine because it's a tactical challenge. You move the hills and the woods and the ruins around, and it doesn't really matter. But actually, with Inquisitors, like, and particularly the way we portrayed it, it's like, well, actually, you want at least three or four different terrain sets, and you want them in a different scale. Yeah. So even though you only need a four by four table, like 
that was quite a challenge. And these days, I don't think, you know, like Games Workshop could just knock out some cool 54 mil terrain, you know, in, in plastic pretty easily. You know, you just look at where they're at now with that plastic technology. It's just like ridiculous. The, what I would do to be able to make Inquisitor now with Games Workshop's technology and the interchangeability of parts and everything else, I would, you know, it's like, it would be amazing. Yeah. <laughs> but also, but also, I still don't know if it'd actually have any much. It would it'd be commercially the same. I think, it's I think so. I was going to say, um, I, still don't, I don't know. still don't think it would sell very well. No, I mean, you can make the models easier to, because the thing is, it was deliberately pitched at people that want to convert and invent their own yeah. things and stuff like that anyway. So you can make it easier with plastic models uh, and give people more options. Of, but actually, you almost lose some of it if you make it too accessible. Yeah. And I don't mean that in an elitist way, but just in a, you know, a... Uh, as soon as you start making stuff cookie cutter, rather than like, well, actually, here's a very bespoke character that you can then change, as opposed to here's a kit that makes five different characters. Mm. It's a different message, and it's, yeah. and it almost undermines slightly what the game was trying to do. Um, so yeah, I'd be, you know, we we talk about you know, would, would Games Workshop do it again? They got obviously the specialist games through Forge World and stuff like that. I'd be, I'd be very surprised. Yes, yeah, no, I, I agree. But it, it, it's not, interestingly, it's, it's, I mean, like so many games that Games Workshop has abandoned along the way, it's still going on in a new form amongst fans. Now, yeah. what, I think what makes it unusual is that unlike other games, you know, where, where you know, Blood Bowl, Games Workshop keeps on circling around to do Blood Bowl again, Necromunda has, has seen a new edition that's been very popular, is doing very well, Adeptus Titanicus is back on the market, um, and even more time has seen it sort of reimagined in the cursed city yes. box. But Inquisitor has very much been been left alone, and with that impression that it there is no interest in going back to it. But it has, as you said, this extraordinary legacy both on the game as it exists and in the community of people who've picked up. Inc. 28, and now we've got something like 28 Mag, this digital mag, if you presumably come yes. across 28 Mag, digital yeah. magazine dedicated to exploring the otherwise unexplored corners of, of the grim dark universes of Games Workshop, which is directly a descendant of Inquisitor and, and the project that it, that it was. And of course, I, I can sit here and say it's a direct inspiration to, to Horizon War Zero Dark. I mean, I, I literally took ideas that I developed when I thought I could pitch a second edition and, and kept them in the back of my head and brought them out again for, for Zero Dark. I mean, the whole Red Force activation system I originally designed for Inquisitor. Yeah. yeah. Which, well, and I think, I think that's the interesting thing, talking about Inquisitor and mechanics and stuff like that, because actually... Um, uh, there's very few things that actually need to, you need to make a game work, and and, and but the thing that give, makes a, a game really work or gives it some character or makes it special is the thing that it's a bit that's different. So like the Red Force, you know, like moving around, shooting and stuff like that. There are a million different ways you can do that in any given game, and the decisions you make will influence the type of game it is. But essentially. They're just kind of like there's a particular conflict. There are numerous conflict resolution mechanics yeah. that you can use. You know, whether it's flipping cards, rolling dice, different kinds, comparing scores, whatever. You know, it's like, but fundamentally, um, you can introduce something that contextualizes those in a completely different way. So, so the the you know, like I say the red force thing. Um, and for me, it, um, it, there's two ways you do it. I think one is what I call command and control. Which is how much you know? It's like uh, lots of games these days, like Saga or Bolt Action stuff like that. You know, you are not in complete control of your forces. Mm. Games Workshop tends to avoid those mm -hmm. essentially. Um, it, they still stick to kind of pretty much. You know, you have your turn, everything moves and stuff. But but essentially, there's a way to monkey between your interaction between you and what your army does and the order they do it. Um, and that can so again, it doesn't really matter how those actions are resolved, how you interact with your army is actually already defined by the game. Or you have a different element, like you say, you have some kind of either solo or co-op or whatever element, which means that the game isn't, uh, or the missions that you do perhaps uh, change the way they play. Again, with latest 40k, one of the things in 8th edition that I really liked and they they did, which uh, is 
and and in Age of Sigma as well, actually, is the objectives will become a lot more interactive and a lot more interesting mm. and things. They actually, so even though the, the, so because because of the way they did, sort of like the way the missions are set up and things, they could move or change or interact with them in different ways over the course of the same game. Yes, it cease to be so, just just a MacGuffin for the sake of. Yeah, it's not just a point on the ground that you protect because you go actually sometimes once you protect it, it disappears and it moves or or and stuff like that. An asymmetric game is another one. Mm. You know, again, I think it was much bigger these days than it used to be. So, <coughs> uh, and so for me, for so you know, deciding to do Inquisitor uh, as like a, a, a pseudo role playing game was very much a choice. But actually, the one mechanic um, <coughs> I would keep in it in some ways actually the unreliable activation mm. so, so in inquisitor oh, you have yes, a, you have was, a speak yes the, brilliant the, 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 what i mean because because actually so for people that don't know basically each character has a speed which is the number of actions they can attempt in a turn mm. yeah so it, it went up to speed six mm -hmm. uh, i think if you're yes. ridiculously psychically quick the eldar yeah. the eldar ranger i think had a had a speed of six i think he was the yeah. fastest in uh, the and what you did is at the start of your what you do at the start of your activation is you say what your character is going to do, what their actions are going to be. So, and you do it in fairly general terms, mm. really, because again, this is pseudo role playing. So it's like he's going to run over there, he's going to swing across that gap, and he's going to fire his bolter at that cultist over there. And then you rolled a dice for each point of speed you had, and each four plus was an action that you had to get up to complete, which was great because because the whole thing was that the thing was that came about three or four games into Inquisitor, and that wasn't there uh -huh. from the start. Uh, but it, but it didn't. It just didn't work without it because mm. if you get to do exactly what you want to do, then you can't help yourself but try and be cautious or or not. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. uh, the, having that unreliability of the characters makes that you play more narratively because you can't absolutely just, you can you can go for it. You know it. it it meant that actually sometimes you could get lucky and do quite a lot, and sometimes you wouldn't do much at all. And it also um, creates a, an emergent narrative, yeah. doesn't it? That all of a sudden you go, well, why did my Speed 5 character yeah. only get one action this turn? Ah, well, yeah. it's because they've spotted that guy over there and they, they're nervous or, or they've just slipped on a rock or they're just yes. trying to reload their weapon. And, and you get an emergent narrative from the mechanics, which I think is, yeah. is it, it's great strength. I think, yeah, well, yeah, it's a narrative comes from games uh, most of the narrative comes from what isn't expected hmm. you see the stuff underperforms or overperforms are the bits that you remember yeah. you know, when your unit of knights charges into goblins and crushes them and wipes them out that's fine when the goblins pass that double one break test and hold that's a story yeah and so i think games have to uh, <laughs> so uh, i always go back to uh, one of my favorite bits from red dwarf is rimmer's risk story when he's talking about it, he said, then I rolled a three and a two. Ah, but then he came back and rolled a four and a five. And he doesn't actually describe the game at all. He, he, has, his, he has basically a notebook full of dice rolls, which are his, yeah, are his battle notes, basically, um, <coughs> which any game could be. Yeah. Uh, but actually, nobody talks about the, you know, when you go back to Bugman's after playing in the Warhammer Hall or whatever it is, or do a battle report, you don't describe the dice rolls. The dice rolls might inform the story, that double six, that double one, that everybody fluffing their saves, whatever. It's mechanically driven, but actually what you remember is your entire front rank dying. Mm. Yeah, that's the story. And so your mechanics have to have the ability to create story, which means they have to have the ability to do the unexpected. I think. Now, here's, uh, a, here's a question back to you on, on that then, because you said way back near the beginning of our, of our conversation that uh, Jake Thornton introduced you to Eurogames. Yes. Because the one thing that Eurogames are notorious for is the lack of randomizer. And yet they can still tell stories. I think, yes. Well, the, the best ones, I think, are the ones that then it's about the meta game mm. almost. It's the outthinking your opponent, but also I think, um, uh, but you have a different interaction. I think with those, I think you, um, uh, because again, you 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 think of the stories more as a player than as as the things in the game. Mm. Whereas I think if you talk about war games or you know, role playing games. You don't necessarily say I did this. You talk about what your character did, and I think you talk about what elements of your army or your force did. 
again, you might, if, if you're doing tactical analysis, you might explain about how you did it. I did a refused flank and then I did this and that and the other. But actually, if you just really, when you're reminiscing about the games, what you end up talking about is how your general did this or your sniper did that ridiculous shot all the way across the board and took out the guy on the first turn kind of thing. Yeah. Or the moment your commander got, got gut punched yeah. by a grotling. <laughs> well, the one I, the, the, the terrible one I remember is actually one of the first Warhammer tournaments we did, staff tournaments. Uh, and actually, my opponent at the time is a really good friend of mine now. But he's a squig hopper landed. So he's 30 point squig hopper landed on my 325 point dwarf demon slayer and killed him. <laughs> both, the, both the squigs attacks hit and wounded. Uh, and the, the clubber on top hit and wounded three wounds dead. And I was just like, what? <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, so that was you know, and that literally you know, twenty five years later, I remember that yeah, exactly, and you'll never forget uh, that moment. Um, whereas what I remember from my games with Jake is just him winning most of the time, <laughs> um, uh, and 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 just getting frustrated because my brain just doesn't work quite in the same way. So like, how did it, uh, and, do, and doing that thing of blaming your own luck when actually it's just like you shouldn't have been relying on luck when you needed that. Mm. Um, uh, so I think you, you tend to uh, so. What you do is, if we have a game of like I don't know, Bonan, I'm trying to think of Euro games, but you know, we have a get, we have a game, and we describe our interactions really if it's a more Euro game style than actually what and the game rather than just the game itself. It's not like aha, and then my farmer planted three beans. No, it's like, no, aha, then I then I remember I screwed you on the chili beans, and I managed to and I got the extra twenty points or something like that. So the narrative is the player. I think interacting rather than the game itself, and I think highlighting where trying to work out where that is again talking <laughs> talking about Jake um, <laughs> and the high elves thing. What an interesting learning experience for me was that uh, Jake for the high elves he came up with this rule called intrigue at court, which was very characterful in the background in that. The high elves rules of politics and stuff like that. So you didn't actually know who was, you, you had to randomly determine who your general was. Ah, so, it, okay. so it, you know, like this prince is like, ha ha, I'm, you know, I'm the prince and I've got the best leadership and stuff. But actually there's some guy from the Tower of Safari who's been put in charge, some like level two mage or whatever. Which was great as a fun mechanic and stuff. High elf players don't like unpredictable. Bit actually. swingy, bit swingy, I would imagine. Well, it, well it, it was sort of. But actually, what I found mostly though is actually it spoiled the role playing aspect of I am the general on the tabletop. Gotcha. Yeah, and I think and so aside from any mechanical considerations, uh, I look back on that as a, a poor choice uh, that we did it because it separ it separated the player from. Oh, uh, you know, this really cool figure or whoever I want to associate with in my army is me. And although that's not part of the mechanics of the game, and is and for lots of people they don't necessarily do that. You know, the, the the human computer that just sees stuff as flank charges and, and percentages and stuff like that, it doesn't matter to them. But actually for most of us it does matter. That mm. storytelling we play to tell stories with our toy soldiers. Have um, you have you had a chance at all to see or play the, the Song of Ice and Fire? miniatures game from, from I have not. Uh, Tool Mini or no. not. Because no. that uh, and I mean it's a it's a good game. I will say this much for it. Is it a very entertaining, interesting game and their main drawback is supply issues over the miniatures. Um but they have a whole political side game to cover the intrigues at court thing. Where yeah. you actually have specific miniatures that you, you add to your army but they never appear on the tabletop. They're over on the side game playing the court intrigue stuff. Right. And, and as that game plays out, it plays certain advantages to your side or to your, to your opponent, depending on how the game plays out. And uh, just in the context yeah. of talking about, you know, intrigue at court with the high elves, that it's an idea yeah. that that has has come back around, but with a very different application. Yes, that, that really ties into that narrative because it tells a separate story that then has yes. an impact yeah. on what's going on on the tabletop. And, and I think you know could have a particular place if we'd actually done a if we'd just done a white dwarf article about battles during the Sundering or mm -hmm. even you know, or, or stuff like that where, where it was all very civil war and and intrigue and, and switching sides and all that kind of stuff, then that would be that would work. That'd actually have context, and actually that's a really good way of doing it because again, it's you, you're not necessarily associating what I mean, you know on that side game they're fancy markers, mm -hmm. but then. There's always a fine line, especially these days when you get very finely detailed playing pieces. Yeah. What's the difference between a what's the difference between a board game and a miniatures game uh, and things like that? Yeah. And you go, 
well, if it's got a board, it's a board game. But but even war games these days, again, and de defining what they are is gets more and more difficult as yeah. other components become more and more miniature-like in their quality. Right. Um, but I think, uh, but that's that's what's really interesting because again, actually, even if the the war game aspect of that game was completely vanilla in terms of what it did as mechanics, having that political aspect change defines that game. But, you know, that's that's your USP, as it were, that can make it a completely different game. Because mm. uh, because actually the resolution of the actions, actually how you shoot, how you move, how you fire and stuff, again, it's not inconsequential, but actually for the flavour and narrative of the game, of, you know, of potentially it doesn't really matter. Mm. You know, it can be rolled a dice on a four plus you hit. Um, because actually a lot of the story is going to be injected from this little sub game it's like saga and the and the battle board mm. idea you know again you've got this this other mechanic that's going on that then informs the story so you know you go, oh no, no god i haven't got anything that can i can't activate my huskars anymore you know it's like oh, well they're obviously just a bit too hung over from the night before or <laughs> whatever it might be you know like say you start to add narrative mm. to explain yeah. away mechanics as long as the, um but the other mechanic but there's also What's interesting about both those examples is there's a physicality to those mechanics. Mm. Again, particularly of a miniatures game, there's there's lots more board gaming, euro gaming elements have come into war gaming. Yes, and as as the quality of war gaming sculpture and aesthetic has moved into board gaming and euro games, yeah. So although there's some euro games that still just use you know like uh, very basic counters and stuff like that, particularly the more Ameritrash style games are you know just like these gloriously over the top, over spec'd spectacles yes, you know yeah, yeah. My, you know for that's part of the fun of it yeah. um but also the more more uh like i said but much more kind of board gaming kind of mechanics and processes coming into war gaming mm -hmm. which was you know because it's moving because they've moved towards games and uh, uh i did a a little patreon post recently which was talking about you know role playing games and actually the amount of role playing and the amount of game in it and again the amount of war in your war games how much is it a simulation and how much is it a game mm. yeah and actually the, that's a movable feast so and actually lots more war games miniatures games these days are much more gamey yes and less about sim you know they they don't try to ignore necessarily the influences of of war and things like that but they understand actually it's the out it's not it's not trying to simulate every single little aspect of it but actually the feeling and the outcomes it's the uh what is it serendipity well no not serendipity but you know it's um i can't even remember the word now. you know it, it gives the feeling that it's right even if it's not trying to mechanically represent every single step mm. If you see what i mean so it's like it feels like this is how like a medieval battle should take place there is similitude Yes, that's the one. Very good. Yeah, very similar. To, yes, exactly. It has that. So rather than simula pure simulation mm. of well, we've got morale effect and range and the weather and the, quite like, actually, uh, we actually we have a much more we have much more playable games now generally. Yeah, um, uh, because a lot of the, there's a, lot, a bit more abstraction comes into it. I think, mm. but actually, what you end up is a result that feels because you're not bogged down in the detail. Yeah, it feels like a lot more like the story of Waterloo or. Uh, you know, like a, a, the, the hunt for Bin Laden or whatever your miniatures game is trying to mm. represent, because you, you're not getting it, they're more focused on the, the, the beats, the, the key elements of battle or whatever, uh, and also just more enjoyable to play. Yes, quite, think, quite. You know, it's, less it's bookkeeping, bit, less maths, more play, yeah. more fun, more yeah. narrative. What? Yeah, but but when you get into a narrative game, which is interesting, like you are relying upon that that awareness of of what should be right so in 40k you know uh an inquisitor relied upon people who have quite a good knowledge of the 40k universe and and how people would act and think and do stuff mm -hmm. and it's the same sort of thing you can't uh, uh unless you provide people with that material you can't just assume that they know uh how you know it's like you get skirmish games now for all sorts of things it's napoleonic skirmish games and obviously dark ages there's lots of skirmishes stuff like that but actually if you're going to go full narrative on that you have to understand the stories and the history that yes. inform those narrative that's still that's actually still quite old school war gaming mm -hmm. of having to do your research and under you know, rather than mechanically within the game saying well this is how you steal a pig and this is how you do the, the, and these are the objectives it's a case of like relying on the the knowledge and the narrative of the players to do it mm. um and so i think there's 
there's two types of narrative really there's ones which uh, you engineer into the game like I've, I always go back to the the canon rules for Warhammer which was one of those so what you did is you oh, guess the, right, the, the artillery, artillery dice, dice. With the artillery dice that was fantastic well, was that, well the, the reason was uh, and it's one of those interesting ones because of course usually you're the general of the army but for these particular situations you zoom in and the narrative is you get to be the gun captain of that cannon or that that stone the orc firing that stone mm -hmm. throw or whatever it is and the mechanics did that it wasn't just an abstract roll of the dice it's like you had to make decisions and then for whatever reasons like maybe you know it's like yeah oh it's not fair on new players i can't guess right it's like whatever i don't, yeah. I don't what you're doing is taking out something that's fun and replace it with something that's functional yeah and and you've re you've removed us because actually and, and the physicality of those dice and then measuring the range and then it getting a bit more the range bounce, and then the, yeah. the bounce and then and the misfire and stuff like that and and the what and actually the one of the biggest lessons the simplest lessons i remember from rick about narrative in game design i've realized it's about you know um which was you know there's the ongoing debate about so in warhammer you roll to hit you roll to wound uh, and then the, the player makes a saving throw mm. um and uh, and some people argued, or you know, certain games argue. Well, why don't you just do the saving throw first? Because then you save yourself a dice roll, potentially. Uh, you know, because like, and Rick was always like, the thing is, uh, or, or what? You know, why didn't you do a save? You could do things in different orders. Yes. The basic thing was, you get to save your model. Absolutely. You have the you have the last dice roll. And that, again, that's just you don't necessarily that mechanically it makes no difference which order the wound roll and the saving roll. Of course. Roll. It's like because they're, they're not interrelated. In terms of their odds or anything like that but narratively and and mechanically as a game you picking up those dice at the end and saving your guys because of their armor is a different thing you yeah. know and, and so thinking about that thinking about the physicality on the board of rolling dice or flipping cards or or the position you know, we pick miniatures gaming because it's tactile and visual and has an aesthetic and actually we should you need to lean into those things when you're designing your rules mm -hmm. so so that you know uh gladiator gladiatorial games are always a tricky one mm. yeah I always find because once things start fighting you don't need the miniatures anymore you know you might have some maneuvering stuff you know, various gladiators or witch fighting games or whatever you know it's like you get to position and then actually whether you've got a paper scissors stone system or whatever your fighting thing is very rarely unless you design the system well do you bother moving the miniatures again because yeah. you've actually you know whereas actually so what you do is like, well, if you can design a Minter's gladiatorial game, you have to make movement really important. So that so things engage and break away and running up and jumping over pits and stuff is all part of the game and gives you advantages in doing it. Uh, as opposed to actually what you've just done is designed an interesting card game. Yeah. And you just you, happen to have some pictures in it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, which, you know, you, go, well, what, what, you can redesign this, to not have the miniatures at all, which is fine. Um, but this is the thing: it's like if you're going to design a miniatures game, understand why are you using miniatures? Yeah. Um, and it's the same with a lot of board games and things as well. Of like, that's just a marker, but it's fine. It looks cool, but actually, why, why, why do you even need that marker? Is that why have you made a physical thing out of that? And and, and other than just to make it you know, a bigger box and it looks cool, and you can add ten dollars more backers but, on the Kickstarter. Well, absolutely. <laughs> so you know. So things like your sideboard with your miniatures on is kind of if it look if it's got the aesthetic if it's not just like a little track or something but it looks like a courtroom I don't know you know and, and there's a thing going on there which having miniatures instead of like a, a, a you know a car. It's been a while since I played it. I genuinely can't remember. So, I can't remember. Or, I don't. Think, least, I think they yeah. were just. I think they were the, the miniatures in the in the political game. I'm pretty sure were, were just aesthetic. Yeah, and also it's a license, so they want to again exactly. the miniatures come first. So yeah. you want to make those particular characters, and you've incorporated them into the game, yeah. and people will want to collect them and paint them. So that's a good enough reason in itself. Quite. It's true, um, but it's nice actually if you just follow through on that kind of aesthetic. So uh, and quite often, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah, Rogue Trader had off-table barrages. Yes, and actually you could you could spend you know you buy one spaceman captain and spend 3,000 points on off-table macro cannons. <laughs> that's not good miniatures. That's not good miniatures design rule. At least have, you know, people say, oh, you know, like, oh, the, the Imperial Guard Bastis, you know, why would you have artillery on the table? It's like, so you can have an art artillery model. You're right. It probably is off-table support. But this is a miniatures game. And therefore, we make decisions to make miniatures of things. Or, put them or on. I'd, I'd rephrase that a little bit, because I'd say at the end of the day, it's, it's because Games Workshop is a miniatures company. 
Yes. It was actually, I mean, one of the features in original Horizon Wars is that theoretically you can have an army with no miniatures at all if you just bought artillery and you never deployed them on the tabletop and just engaged. In fact, you'd need one. Yes. You'd need a recon element to, yes. to direct the fire. Well, and then it was the same you'd need to do something yeah. else. Um, but that's, I could get away with that because I wasn't trying to sell miniatures. Yes. But, it, but you also have to say it's that is it, uh, there's also a difference between you can do a thing and is it really viable to do it? Oh, thing? yeah. <laughs> as soon as they shoot that recon element. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, then so you again. Them all on the but yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. Um, look, Gab, I'm sorry. Uh, I know, I'm going to have to wrap us up. I, We're an hour I told you I could talk forever. <laughs> I could talk to you for hours, but but my, my poor wife is currently recovering from her second COVID jab. Oh, right. And I need to go and make sure that she hasn't passed out in the course of our conversation. So uh, we're going to wrap this up. I'm going to thank you very, very much. And will you leave the door open for me to maybe have you have you back on the podcast again? Because you Absolutely. clearly have plenty to say, and I would love yeah, to hear yeah, you say it. Yeah, yeah, no, we'll chat again, definitely. And I, I, I want to do the same in reverse, actually. I want to talk to you for my Patreon. Awesome. Because uh, awesome, your experience you. will be useful for a lot of people as well, more useful than my experience. <laughs> <laughs> Right, okay. Well, I shall let you go. Gav, thank you very much. My, my usual thing is that after I've spoken to my guest, I, I then go away and think about what they've said, and then I come back and do a sort of 15-minute after-interview wrap-up. And, and I, I have no idea what I'm going to talk about, because there have been so many different things. I've been making notes as we go along about things I could put into the wrap-up, and there are so many different things, and I can't decide what I'm going to, what I'm going to pick on. So I think I'm going to have to sleep on this uh, a couple of days before I wrap it up. Okay, then thank you ever so much for joining me, Gav. Uh, My pleasure. I, I look forward to speaking to you again in the future. Otherwise, cheerio. Thank you, cheerio. Right, I'm back. And if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, well, now you can see me. Because uh, because I'm not recording this over broadband, it means I can afford to record video at the same time. So uh, if this comes as a shock, I apologise. Okay, um, I said I needed to sleep on what Gav and I discussed, and it turned out to be bigger than that. Um, it took me a couple of days sort of mulling it over, and, and then I went and got my second COVID jab, and then I spent 48 hours feeling like death. So um, I am now finally back and have had a chance to revisit everything that Gav and I discussed and pick through it for the things that I think are, are the big takeaways. And there's so much to take away that was, was little and interesting. And, and I say little, I mean, there's sort of detail stuff um, in that and that the story for me of how Inquisitor, you know, a game so close to my heart, came to be... Um, and I suppose also kind of the story of how it came to fail. Really, really interesting. Um, and, and there's a lot I could take out of that, but I'm, I'm not. I'm going to resist that temptation and put those things to one side. Um, I want to talk about two things. So the first thing I wanted to talk about was Gav talked about the, the tension between three parts of Games Workshop when he worked there. And he talked about the tension between design, manufacturing, and sales. And that at different phases in Games Workshop's life cycle, different parts of that triangle were more dominant than the others. And, and it could be said, and, and maybe somebody who currently works there would say, that the modern current contemporary games workshop has those three things in balance and maybe it does i don't know that's not what i wanted to talk about what i wanted to talk about was what the small designer or the small manufacturer can take away from that question you now what can a precinct omega or a bad squiddo or a macrocosm or a mirsha or even a corvus belly learn about the tension between design, manufacturing, and sales. And, and is that all there is to it? And, and actually, the first thing I want to say is almost yes. You could argue it. You could, you could push for things that could be in there that aren't. Um, I, for a long time, thought should, man should management 
be a part of that. But actually, no, because each of those sections has its own management contingent, its own leadership group, and they are part of the competition with the other groups. So, no, I think design, manufacturing and sales really is, as, as Gav put it, the trinity in many industries, not our own, that exist in harmony, hopefully, in, in creative competition to succeed. But when you're talking about a small business, you know, a micro enterprise, like so many businesses in miniature wargaming are, what does it mean? It, and it means that any given day, a small business owner has to decide where they're going to put their attention. It's very hard to have a day at work where you're focused on all three of those things. Where you're focused on both the physical creation of new product and the design of future product and the process of creating sales of that product and making your product appear in the hands of your customers. Um, you almost always have to spend each day on focused focused on just one of those things. And there is a tendency, and I can see this in myself, there is a tendency to spend the majority of your time on the one where you are most comfortable. Which isn't fundamentally a bad thing, but none of those things exists in a vacuum. You know, you can sell all you like, but if there's no new content, there's no new products, and you're going to run out of things to sell. You can manufacture lots of stuff, but if you haven't got the process in place of actually moving that volume of stuff into the hands of customers, you're never going to make a living. You can design till you're blue in the face, but if it doesn't turn into an actual product, it's never going to make you any money. And, I mean, I... I think you wouldn't be surprised if I tell you that my comfort zone is design. You know, that's where I feel most comfortable is in the process of developing a new product. Um, and it's hard to know where the line is actually drawn for me between design and manufacture. So, you know, when I'm deciding on the layout and the formatting and the, and the page design and the photography of a new product, is that manufacturing or is that design? And that, you know, I'm not sure, but I'm comfortable in that space. You know, I'm, I am comfortable in the space where you start at conceptualising a game and you finish. OK, I, my comfort zone ends a few steps before the final product is released. Um, I am a terrible completer finisher. Um, if my livelihood didn't rely upon me creating new products for Precinct to make and nothing would ever get finished. Um, Fortunately, the pressure of needing to actually make a living means that I do create new products once in a while, which is good. Um, but the sales process is one that I find incredibly difficult uh, for a lot of reasons. Um, one is that as a, as a sole enterprise, you know, a single person business, you know, the process of selling things is on my shoulders. Um, and, yeah, you know, word of mouth does well and reviews are great, but pretty much everything has to be initiated by me. I have to be putting the product in the hands of enough people that there's going to be word of mouth gen. I have to be contacting reviewers and telling them about the books and the game and, and persuading them that it's worth looking at and talking about. Um, I have to be running my website and making sure that it is actually generating enough sales to cover the costs of maintaining it, which is highly questionable at the moment. Um, it, it's not my comfort zone. It's not where I feel happy at all. Um, and it tends to be the place where I go to when I'm in panic mode. If I'm comfortable, if I'm relaxed, I'll do design and manufacture. I will create new products. Um, when I'm panicking, 
uh, when I'm looking at my bank account, for example, uh, that's when I tend to go to sales. So all of my sales activity tends to be conducted in a, in a state of mild panic. Um, and I'm not sure that that's, that's healthy. Um, but it's definitely something to bear in mind. Um, you know, I am a strategist. I am someone who, who likes to plan. And I have never written a sales strategy. All of my strategies have been around design and manufacture. And, and a little bit marketing. Yes, I do have a marketing plan, but I don't have a sales strategy. So that is something that perhaps I could take away from this and learn and try to apply intelligently what is, what is my strategy for actually creating sales and see if I can double down on that idea. Um, so that was sort of half of what I took away from my conversation with Gav, the big, big things. The other one that occurred to me um, sort of grew out of... Uh, several conversations. The one I had with Jake, the one I had with Gav, um, and I've had a few conversations with other people, and the question that keeps pinging into my mind over this is, where are the new game designers coming from? Um, and, and I don't ask that uh, rhetorically, because you know, we've talked about how, how Jake and Gav and Andy and Alessio, um, Thomas, how, how these people have sort of become names to conjure by within miniature war games, that, that they became prominent and interesting to people through their work at Games Workshop. And now that Games Workshop has a more corporate approach to design, a more team-based approach and there's there, there's no longer this tendency to let a single person be identified with with the development of a new product where are the new I don't want to say celebrity game designers where are the new names in game design going to come from and it seems to me that they're going to come from two places now, one is the obvious one, which is the one that I represent, which is the self-made game designer. People like me, uh, people like Ivan, um, I'm trying to think of uh, some other, uh, obvious, I should have lots. Um, oh, um, Uncle Atom on uh, Tabletop Minions, who's just released uh, Rain in Hell, fabulous little fantasy demon-themed skirmish game. Um, you know, the, these are the self-made designers. So these are people who have basically just decided they're going to write miniature war games. And there's no shortage of us around. Um, uh, I should be able to name him off the top of my head. Uh, McCulloch. Joe. Joseph McCulloch. Uh, Frostgrave. Stargrave. You know, he's really become a, a name. You know, a name that... that means something, you know, when he self-published uh, Rangers of Shadow Deep, you know, that was a fantastically successful product because he had a name that carried weight, that communicated a certain quality to people that they were, were willing to believe in. So, you know, the self-made game designer is, is still a thing. Uh, it's still something that it is possible to become with the right opportunities and if I ever have the chance I'll, I'll talk about the opportunities that made it possible for me to do it. They, they were not insignificant, it wasn't, you know, I had a luck factored into the fact that I can even try to do what I do now. So, you know, we can't overlook that fact. But my other thought goes back to my conversation with Ben Calvert-Lee a few weeks ago. Uh, the 3D sculptor who works and coordinates sculpting for GCT Studios. So um, Ben began his work as uh, doing a game design degree. And that is increasingly becoming a, a thing that people want to do and that universities want to offer. Not every university, but many universities 
uh, particularly those with a strong emphasis on, on technical disciplines. I know that uh, Cardiff University, for example, offers a highly regarded game design course. Now, these game design courses are focused on um, computer game design because that's the big money industry. And I think as Ben found, the course that, that he did was perhaps narrowly focused on specific areas of computer game design that may not be immediately relevant to tabletop game design. But modern game design courses that have learnt and built upon um, the experiences of industry professionals who are leaving the industry and coming into academia to teach on these courses and feedback from students who are completing the courses, particularly those of reputable institutions, are responding to understand that a game design course is not just about the creation of digital assets that can be bolted into a game, um, that actually there is a discipline to game design the, the mathematics, the narrative, the management, the development, the sales, uh, the project leadership that is associated with this kind of, of project that these courses are starting to teach. And I think increasingly new game designers are going to start to come out of this kind of background. And they're going to have a very different experience in the industry, I think. You know, these are people who are looking for jobs. They are not looking to be independent. They're not looking to create things on their own, necessarily. Now, that's not to say that some of them won't, but that's probably not going to be the primary motivation of most people going into this. They are going to want to take those courses and use them as a pathway into work for large companies for whom the development of games of one sort or another is an important part of their business model. Now, will those people become recognised in those companies? Probably not. But it will give them uh, a practical exposure to an understanding of the process of developing a good game, whatever form it takes that they will potentially be able to pivot to creating something independently, whether it's these new in indie design studios for digital games or whether it's a kick-started board game that takes the world by storm. Who knows? Who knows? There are new names coming out. There are new sources of game design celebrity and they will find their way by hook or by crook, into miniatures war games as much as they will every other aspect of tabletop and digital gaming. So, so I don't think that, that we have lost anything in Games Workshop's change in how they approach their designers, not, not as a society. Um, there, are, there is like one fewer opportunity in an industry that is still full of opportunities. Miniatures War Games is just this tiny, tiny niche of a niche of a niche. Um, but there's so much crossover and there's so much interaction between these. Um, as Jake found when he went away to work in the digital development world, um, as Gav has found moving into fiction um, and, uh, and, and other consulting work, um, and as people have found who've stayed in miniature war games but found new niches to explore, whether that's starting their own companies or becoming reliable consultants to a variety of different companies. So, you know, it, it's a big space, is what I'm saying. You know, and this podcast only looks at this tiny part of it, but it's a big space and there's a lot of crossover. Okay, that's all I had to say. That was what I found sort of most stayed with me from my conversation with Gav. Um, but obviously there was masses in there. I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope this hasn't all been too long for you. I look forward to speaking to you again soon. If you're watching this on YouTube, please, please do like and subscribe. Um, you 
my subscriptions uh, on YouTube are going to become quite important to me over the next few months because I'm going to try to actually monetize my YouTube channel. So if I go on about it a lot, I'm really sorry. If you do want me to stop, hey, go subscribe. Um, and if I get enough subscribers, I promise I'll stop telling you to subscribe. All right, how's that? Thank you very much for coming. I will speak to you again next week. The Precinct Omega Game Design Podcast is supported by our patrons on Patreon. Go to patreon.com forward slash Precinct Omega to help us continue developing new games and creating hobby content for war games enthusiasts all over the world.